So um, before I start, I feel um, the need to publicly thank um, my advisors this semester, Dewitt and um, Ellen Rothenberg, as well as my advisors last semester, Claire and Terry Capsalis. I think um, one of the things that I really struggle with in my work is articulating uh, what's happening, and so. Um, yeah, I've, I guess I've just I felt so um, supported here uh, by my advisors in a way that I hadn't uh, experienced before um, in kind of figuring those things out. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank them. Oh, wait. Sorry. I just realized, also I'm sick, so I'm going to stand and try to project my voice. Yay. And I realized I needed to... <laughs> constructing an image, so not um, not just documenting something that was out of my reach or that I um, didn't have the ability to control, but rather a thing that I could set up, I could control all aspects of it. And in that way, that is a thread that um, connects to uh, my work now. So thankfully, I had a lot of um, really nice friends that would let me um, do weird shit to them. So, um, yeah, and, and in some ways, also, it's like, I, I used to just see these as a photograph, but I guess now I see them as a, almost like a kind of a, a, a performance, like they let me kind of photograph them longer <coughs> for me. Um, so, my freshman year at uh, BYU, I had made friends with my roommate, who was a writer, and um, her and I had a lot of discussions on the role of art, the role of writing, um, the role that language played, um, kind of in and among uh, those things, uh, and how they differed 
And so we decided to work together on this project. We called it some zine. Um, and it's not really like a zine. It's more like a book. Pro like, I, I don't really know quite how to describe it, but it's, it was a collaboration of poetry and photographs. Um, and with this project, we thought a lot about, so at this time, um, we were practicing Mormons. Um, and we thought a lot about the suffering, <coughs> the suffering of Christ and the Mormon doctrine about his atonement. Um, so that not only did he suffer the sins of, um, of every person that lived on the planet, but that he also suffered um, pains and afflictions and things that go beyond the kind of realm of like sin. And so, and because he had suffered these things that he was the only uh, being that could ever truly empathize with any pain or suffering we might experience. Um, so we were thinking a lot about suffering, the body, and empathy. Um, so like with this image, we were thinking about kind of like reperforming the, um, the crucifixion, so using the staples of the book to kind of go through the wrists and the hands. Um, and then also thinking about transcendence and the role of suffering and being alive and the necessity of language um, in um, binding words and people, words and subject to object and subject, denying divorce and otherness, as she wrote in this poem, Credo. Um, and then the role that personal suffering might play in um, personal development, um, much like grad school. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then also thinking about the relationship um, in scripture to the act of seeing and the act of um, putting clay or dirt on one's eyes. So in um, Mormon scripture, um, there's a more detailed account of the prophet um, Enoch and of him sort of becoming a prophet and basically God told Enoch to, um, to anoint thine eyes of clay and wash them and thou shalt see as this sort of prerequisite for him becoming like a prophet, seer, and revelator. Um, and then also thinking about the story of Christ in the New Testament, um, healing a blind man by telling him to wash his eyes with mud. Um, and so um, uh, this sort of like beautiful metaphor of kind of like um, being able to see for the first time or seeing something anew through this kind of strange process. Um, and in some ways, almost is like is like baptismal in a way, and just kind of renewing. Um, so um, this was the first time that I'd experienced, uh, or that I had explored the book as a form and as a space for a kind of um, meditation on religious belief, as a kind of like documentation of these performances, um, instead of the more overt religious texts in scripture that I had been used to. Um, so shortly after that project came out and was printed, um, I left for a year and a half where I served a mission um, for the church. I was assigned to the Philippines. And um, despite some concerns that I had about my religion, I felt that it was important to demonstrate my faith to God um, and my willingness to serve him. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess I talk about my mission because it is so influential um, in a lot of different ways. Um, so in one of the ways, it was this year and a half, it was this 18 months where I wasn't really producing any work. Um, because our schedule was so tight, it was, um, other than a few like tiny sketches in my notepad, I really was not able to like make work. And this was like a thing that I really struggled with, but also <coughs> thought it was necessary for me to fulfill my role as a missionary, to bring people to Christ, to teach, to proselytize. So it was this thing that I sort of sat aside for 18 months, um, despite how uh, painful that was for me. Um, so it was also a time where I was immersed in a culture and a language, um, Tagalog. So I um, learned Tagalog. Um, and so just and generally like being in this foreign place. And so this process of um, adapting to living and working with Filipinos without the crutch of other Americans being around forced a change in perception and in language that I had never before experienced. So for example, I would, if not hundreds or thousands of times, um, talk with people in the market and say things like, 
gandang hapon po ako po si Sister Vickers, mga missionary po kami na ng simbahan ni Jesus Kristo ng mga banal sa mga mga araw. Naniniwala ba kayo kay Jesus Kristo? So, good afternoon. I'm Sister Vickers. We're missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? So, Instead of my languages being default or neutral in my mind, I came to realize that my thoughts and even my personality was based so much upon the language that I was speaking and the culture that I was in. So it produced this notion of relativism in terms of who I thought I would be. Um, and it incited the sense of instability and uncertainty um, about something that had previously felt very stable. I kind of thought that I had this very strong sense of self and being in this other culture and speaking this language, it was sort of this, I saw this new side of me that I'd never seen before and it kind of was this um, extremely um, kind of scary at times because I could, it was like I was almost losing control in a way of who I thought that I was. Um, so despite this year and a half of me not making work, it very much um, set the stage for the work that um, I uh, did afterwards. So, um, so this series called Simulacra was actually named after the fact because there was about um, a year and a half to two years where I kept photographing photographs, and I wasn't really sure why I was doing this. Um, and it was when I was reading um, Boudreau's Simulacra and Simulation that um, things started to click, and that's when it was sort of like, this is, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this idea of um, discussing reality and signs and symbols and, these, and the fact that these things are kind of separate, um, but also related. So, um, so at the time, I wasn't thinking too much about where these images were coming from, the, pho the photographs in the photographs. Um, so I got them from uh, books at thrift stores, from the internet, from the special collections archive uh, at my school where I worked in the dark room, uh, from my grandmother, or even from my own work that I had um, shredded, um, which is like a couple images down from this. Um, so this was the beginning of really wanting to talk about photography and its eerie and exhausting quality of kind of constantly referring to something else, of, of sort of pointing elsewhere and rarely um, kind of like pointing just at itself. Um, so um, this, during, around this period of time where I was making this work, this is also about the time when I lost my belief in um, Mormonism as the one and only true religion on the earth, and this was deeply painful and traumatic for me. So navigating um, this loss of belief, uh, while st still attending BYU, which um, was extremely difficult as I risked ostracism uh, and potential expulsion if my beliefs or non-beliefs had been known more publicly. So it was a, kind of a time uh, where I sort of had to hide um, what I was feeling. Um, so, um, unfortunately, a lot of the rhetoric in the church among members um, about those who leave is um, pretty divisive, and it's very black and white. <coughs> those who lose their belief are discussed as being sinful or lazy or as being deceived by Satan. And the, the kind of rhetoric of if you're not with us, then you're against us is like very much abounds. And so the simplistic rhetoric um, further divides people from their families. So because of my own experience with this and because I didn't want to risk um, um, my, my uh, sorry, I should like go further down. Basically, I was working on my BFA thesis show. And so kind of in thinking about this culture, I didn't want to risk making something to um, overtly provoking or potentially offensive to the audience at UAU for fear of, um, um, yeah, for fear of ostracism or potentially 
having problems with my graduation. I know it sounds silly, but it's a very difficult, it's hard to explain the culture there. It's like, it's a very real thing where shows did have gotten taken down and, and censored. Um, there we are. Um, yeah, okay, so, um, so it was extremely important to me that I did not fall into a simplistic interrogation of my epistemological shift, where an offense could be easily taken by the majority of that institution. Um, and so there, there's a next couple of phrases that, um, um, about this work, or in articulating the work, that um, I need to credit to um, Dewey because because I, I feel like he just like hits the nail on the head in discussing these things. So the idea of this persistence of multiplicity and a refusal to be fixed um, was absolutely essential with this particular show, and then also continues on with my current work. So it was a persistence in rejecting a simplistic view of my religion and my leaving it. And by rejecting a black and white mentality about the church for my work, refuting an exclusionary framework around belief, I see the embracing of nuance as an empathetic and more compassionate gesture with implications that extend hopefully beyond my uh, experience with Mormonism. Um, so with this show, I wanted to work with authoritative images, meaning images of a religious nature, and specifically images from publications and magazines from the Mormon church. So I made an archive of these images, and after pouring through um, uh, thousands of these magazines, I picked um, a select few that I wanted to work with and use in um, this. So, oh, images as well as like footage. So this is a screenshot of um, General Conference, which is a semi-annual conference um, of the church that's worldwide. And maybe 90 to 95 percent of the speakers are are men. Um, and which was disconcerting to me because it is this sort of time of revelation of kind of like declaring the goodness of God and yet um, women were kind of excluded from expressing that knowledge um, or that belief. Um, and so I was interested in this kind of liminal space of this kind of space in between speakers and really just uh, making it huge and just kind of like uh, meditating on it in a way. Um, uh, yeah. So a few of you have seen this, but I'll play uh, maybe just 30 seconds or so of it. these images that I was gathering from their very overt didactic realms and force a new, more ambiguous context on them. I was thinking a lot about um, empty space and spaces where liminality was an excess or was absent. Um, so I knew that the show was successful when both my active Mormon and ex-Mormon friends felt able to enter the space and talk with me about the work without feeling uh, alienated. Um, or especially when the gallery director of <coughs> this BYU gallery, who was a Mormon bishop, told me that he really loved the, uh, the pulpit piece. And I was like so excited about that. Because it, instead of it being this alienating thing, it was this thing that connected sort of these people on both sides of this kind of gap um, and divide, which is, which is really important to me, that the work is not alienating to the people that, are, that I love and that I care about still um, in my life. Um, this is just a short clip. I might uh, kind of just go forward. So this is just a two-channel. I forgot to write that. But it's a two-channel projection on the wall um, of these kind of repeated clips of um, these old Mormon films uh, where nothing was happening, basically. There's these kind of gaps in conversation. Um, yeah, and then this is a wall installation. This is um, a close-up of that. 
Um, so um, after graduation, um, a few friends and I, um, um, artist friends, um, oh, is that me? Yeah. Well, that's okay. Should I? Um, Are you on my camera? Yeah. Um, so we wanted to do a project. Um, uh, we wanted to create a book um, dealing with the role of knowledge and religion, but also thinking more about the epistemological shifts that happen when one leaves a religion. So we got a grant to do this project, um, and we realized that we kept talking about our experiences in the church, and we had sort of left this belief system. We kept talking about it, talking about it, and so we sort of like building blocks of like Mormon vernacular couldn't. They weren't leaving, and so it made sense then to go back to this archive that I had made and um, re and use different images, but to really kind of further displace them and remove their ground. So we're also we also worked with music and texts, um, and then also I don't know if you've noticed, but there are numbers <coughs> placed throughout these images. So we also made a footnote system in the book um, where. Uh, we were just interested in that kind of like academic authority that a footnote gives, but also in subverting that authority through these sometimes true, sometimes false, sometimes might as well be true um, bits of information. So this is what I was working on last semester. Um, these are just examples of the footnotes. Um, and <coughs> yeah. So then the work that I'm kind of doing more recently is dealing with these like redacted texts and taking out um, the nouns, pronouns, verbs, and, and really just leaving the sort of like architectural like structure of this of scripture of like these kind of scripturey sounding words like wherefore and unto and amen. Um, and then um, really kind of like almost letting it bleed or kind of confusing that space. So this is a close-up, so it's the, the text, but it's been kind of like lost in a way um, and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's excess. So um, yeah, I will, I guess, skip ahead to, oh, and then also just thinking about kind of like the architecture of this page and kind of even further reducing the scripture um, as this kind of two column and then three column footnote system. Um, yeah, and then so I'll just close, I'll just play this video. This is like a sketch for um, like a performative lecture that I'm working on dealing with the text. So I will leave it at that. Why yeah. is that concept important to you? Yeah, because it was this. Because it, it's like this um, kind of hard to define space, I guess. Like this sort of in betweenness. And in thinking, I guess, like so, in thinking about the like the stand up, sit down. Mm -hmm. So it was this sort of like the beginning of the song, and then jumping kind of right right to the end, and sort of like skipping. Like, so this middle space is completely like absent. Um, and then also, even with this tour, kind of like this space, I was just so interested in this space right here and right here because it's this like, because it's sort of like, you know, this, uh, it's like the color's been kind of washed out. It's this sort of in between, between like this image and then the water. It's like this kind of connecting point. Um, and do you know yeah. why that's so interesting to you, or attractive, or repulsive, <coughs> or whatever it is? I guess it's, um, I don't know, yeah, I guess I just see it as a sort of connecting point. Mm. And kind of like having it be absent, or like 
so much of this, um, or having like an excess of it. Um, excess of? Excess of like, so this, like this feels excessive to me, like of this kind of in-between moment, and then, you know, making it 40 inches, and, and just really like having that be the thing that's kind of um, meditated on, I guess. So you're creating an, an excess of yeah. liminality. Yeah, yeah. Because you want to slow things down, or you want to dwell in yeah. a place that's less defined, or yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Claire. As, as always, <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in your performative work here, considering your work with text, mm -hmm. a standalone, and considering your title name, mm -hmm. pairing that with an image, um, especially how performative. It is so I'm interested in um, how does the visual function in the yeah. lecture or it, what does it? Because um, I mean, I'm seeing like, you, uh -huh. um, it looks like a photograph of like, many layers of like the text. Um, but also, what you're reading, how you're reading, and how some of your past uh, images function within that. So, I, I mean, I also was thinking about like, your future work and continuing this piece. Um, so I'd love to hear some of the things you're considering in the performative lecture. Like I can see some of those images that you've done you know, throughout this you know, period, it seems like several years of work that you've gone through um, in addendum or in addition yeah. to the text. And I feel like they existed as evidence or, evidence or artifact or it's pushed back. Yeah. And also, I see that. Sit down. Sit, you know, stand up. Sit down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just thinking about all of this brown work and how that functions, uh, or can function, both in performance or yeah, or how yeah. are you implicated in that, or are you implicated in that? Totally. Yeah. I feel like the element of performance was um, in so like in stand up, sit down. It was like I. That was just found footage, you know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah, like, I'm yeah. performing for me, you know, sort of like I made it kind of into this performative act. Right? Mm -hmm. And then with these other images, like, that I had photographed a lot of friends doing weird shit for me. Like, it was like they were performing and I wasn't. And I, and I, I don't know if there was like a kind of an uneasiness with that. Um, but I'm, try, I'm trying to like address that, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, this lecture is actually supposed to be Performative, but I, I but I well, but I had some complications. So. Okay, well, I mean, so I didn't. So, so anyways, yeah, I mean, this. However, you're moving forward. Yeah, is, is positive and right. So. Come on, okay. <laughs> reframing. <laughs> yeah. Um, beyond this um, liminal space or the um, <coughs> between image and erasure. Um, there's something about um, removing and bringing something forward, mm -hmm. and I'm not necessarily um, sure if this is something that you want to answer today, but I would be interested in what are the things that you haven't left behind mm -hmm. from your religion, and what are the things that you've absolutely um, dismissed or walked away from, and how that like specifically relates to your work. and. Um, not not just like not just because I want to know you better, but because I think so much of that process has been connected to this specific practice. So yeah, yeah. You know, here you're literally highlighting and then and then and writing a poem. So I'm kind of interested in what gets written over and also kind of what gets highlighted. So yeah. Um. Yeah, man, that's like a really long, yeah, I feel like I have to give a really long <laughs> answer to really answer that um, fully, but I guess um, with this in particular, and I, I see it as a sketch because it only exists exists in like a digital way and I don't like that about it, but mostly what I liked was the, the kind of the, the idea that the act of erasure was also, the, was also like revealing, you know, of, of the letter beneath it, so it was this kind of like dual action where one caused the other. Um, and then, I don't know, in terms of your other, I guess your other, the other part of your question, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's just really complicated, I guess. Like, my whole family is Mormon, and so it's, um, there's a, a lot of parts of it that I, at times now I feel even like nostalgia about, like about certain parts of um, my 
of my uh, belief system. And then other parts, obviously, like the patriarchal nature of the religion. Uh, you know, I mean, I can go on and on and list sort of the things that I'm really kind of not interested in, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the, the ritual, the, the scripture, like are you building your own language? Mm. Or, you know, like I think that, yeah, like what you're actually forming through all these gestures, like are you creating your own religion? Or are you just interested in erasing previous scripture? You know, that's... Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I'm not trying to form my own language or trying to um, form my own religion. I guess kind of more of um, trying to expand upon this, like, vernacular that already exists or this set of texts that already exists and kind of reveal them in a new way or re reveal them in a less... Um, or maybe reveal their dogma or reveal the ways in which they're harmful, um, if that makes any sense. So I, I am still, like, I'm not trying to create, like, a new thing, more of just revealing the kind of, like, what's underneath. But that's interesting, too, because, you know, the whole tradition of exegesis mm. of the of the sacred texts. Yeah. Um, but you're doing it in this way that's visual and perhaps not with the same uh, intention. Yeah. I'm not saying your intentions are bad. Right. They're just, uh, they're just um, maybe not authorized or they're right. not identified right. with authority. Right. Right. An existing authority. Right. When you were talking about uh, taking risks, but when you see um, just like showing your personal religion thing to public, it's another way to take away something. Yeah, so was that a, a question? Or was that a question? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you just mean, just, were you talking about like, the, my thesis <laughs> show? Maybe may a thesis show? Oh, no, no, no. Or just, just like in general. Just oh. like you work is actually it's a really personal or danger thing. And you are showing mm -hmm. this private thing to the public. It's actually another kind of uh, taking risk to me. It's not literally just a hurt of people who care, but it's another kind of just a use yourself to take the risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I hope, I guess I hope that, that uh, non Mormons, I guess, are, are interested in this work or interested in this conversation. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that, but yeah. <laughs> As a non-woman, I really like your work. Because <laughs> I feel like, um, what's the opinion? Like my, I think like good artwork, when they're talking, even talking about the exact topic, like race or religion or anything, like they have some common thing that's beyond. Like yeah. that's like the common thing, that's what you talk about when you're like giving a, a like just now when you say yeah. you want to find out something that um, didn't alienize you and the person you love. Yeah. And I think that's the core thing of your work that I really like. Thank you. Yeah.